Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the developing process of the 13 English colonies. Today we're going to start out with the southern colonies, and then we're going to progress forward into the New England colonies, and then to the middle colonies. And on your worksheet that I've provided, on the back side of it, we're going to start out with some side notes. And so if there aren't any questions on there, you're going to be copying down some notes from the lecture, and they're called side notes. And uh, the first thing we're going to start out with is the idea of English colonization. Um, pretty straightforward. The English want to colonize because they are motivated to colonize. The Spanish have had success. The French are having success in America. And so the English want that same kind of success. And there's really just four reasons why people came to the New World from England. Religious freedom was the first. Then riches, making money, obviously. Uh, then land. Um, remember, England is an island. It has nowhere to go. So naturally, if you're going to settle in a colony, you may want to consider settling uh, in a place that has lots and lots of land. It's land. Um, and so the colonies in America were filled with land opportunities. And then lastly, commercial trade. Um, the idea of the Columbian Exchange has opened up people's eyes, and they are going to take advantage of that and move goods all over the world. Now, how they went about colonizing has a couple of different forms. Um, we'll talk about this in a later lecture, um, dealing with the different types of colonies, proprietary, charter, or royal colony. But uh, to begin our story, we start with the early, uh, late 1500s, when at a place called Roanoke, just off the coast of North Carolina, present-day North Carolina, uh, and by the way, this still goes on the back side of your assignment, um, you can... Um, like I said, turn your paper over and put side notes. This is part of the side notes. Um, but Roanoke is the first attempt at English settlement in North America. And it happens, like I said, off the coast of North Carolina. And it began as a proprietary colony. Um, Sir Walter Raleigh was uh, given land opportunities by the Queen in 1585. And he sent over a couple of groups of people to settle and to colonize. And uh, after dropping off these settlers um, for a second time, uh, they, had to, they actually got picked up after um, Francis Drake was in Spanish Florida defeating the Spanish down there. Um, he picked up a group and he brought them home. Uh, then they went and dropped off another group and that group was led by a guy by the name of White. Well, White ended up leaving his family um, to go back to England and get supplies. And during that time period, Queen Elizabeth had declared war on the Spanish, and uh, she needed every boat in her fleet to take on the Spanish Armada, and they were successful in defeating them. Well, that took about three years, and with that war, uh, Governor White was gone. When he returned, the colony had vanished. Okay, and mysteriously disappeared. And it is known today as the Lost Colony of Roanoke. And it's a pretty cool story. Um, you can look it up and do some research if you want. But ultimately, uh, there is no sign of what happened to these people. Uh, all that's left is... Um, uh, you know, a sign on a tree that spelled Croatoan, uh, and that's the name of an Indian tribe about 50 miles inland. And uh, they never found any traces of the people, and no one knows what happened to them. It today is still the unsolved mystery of 400 years. So, naturally, uh, the queen says no more colonization. Well, they have to wait till she dies, and her successor says, let's colonize. And where do they go? They go to a place called Virginia. And they settle at Jamestown. Now, we're on the front side of your worksheet there, and uh, they'll, I'll start answering some questions that are asked of you uh, on your um, student notes. Um, so make sure as you watch this and follow along, you can answer some of those questions. But Jamestown was the first successful English settlement in America, established in 1607. And the reason it's successful is obviously they survived and they moved on and did great things. So how did that happen? Well, Jamestown was made a success because of certain events and certain things that took place. If you were absent on this day, you missed the video that I showed. And I'm not sure that I will be able to post that video because it was about 25 or 30 minutes long. Um, but you are welcome to come and get a copy from me if you would be interested in watching the Jamestown story. Um, but ultimately, it required great people doing great things. And you can see this is what Jamestown was, is a model of what it would have looked like when it was done. Um, the picture in the background that I'm using right here uh, is, is actually that 
them kind of building that setup. And where they established their, their colony was not on a great spot. It was a swampy land. Not even the Native Americans wanted it. Uh, but that being said, there were some challenges that they faced, and they had some good people involved. Captain Newport, uh, John Smith, Pocahontas. Uh, this is John Smith. Um, that's what he looked like. My guess, if I were to cast him now, I would probably make him uh, this actor. Uh, but anyway, John Smith was pretty rough and tumble guy, and uh, they, they struggled through some early things. They, they did good leadership to get him through it for the most part. John Smith was one of those guys. Um, he took control after uh, being gone, and Captain Newport went back for supplies. And in that first year, he kind of helped him stay alive. Um, he had a work ethic concept that is still part of our culture and our heritage. If you don't work, you don't eat. And that is pretty much what our country's founded on and the idea of, of what we all believe in. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, he convinced the Powhatan to trade for corn, and that saved them. Um, we're not sure if the relationship he had with Pocahontas made that happen or what, but, you know, he, he did care about the uh, young Pocahontas. By the way, when they met, he was 28 and she was 12. So a little awkward. Anyway, uh, John Smith and... Uh, this guy by the name of John Rolfe and Pocahontas would all play important roles in the, in this story. Um, oops, got a little air here. Fix that. Sorry about that. Just noticed a little mistake there. <laughs> uh, Jamestown was only successful because it survived the tough times, the starving time. And it did happen twice. The second time it happened, John Smith wasn't around, and he actually went home to England. There were over 500 colonists that were dropped off by Captain Newport, and within that year of being gone, um, you know, they were not able to keep people alive, and over 440 of them died. By the time that John Rolfe shows up, uh, even though Pocahontas and her people, the Powhatan people, provided winter provisions, it did help, but it didn't keep everybody alive. By the time John Rolfe showed up, um, they were uh, only 60 people left. And you can watch that part of the video. I will include that. It is on, um, on Edmodo here. But uh, tobacco is what really saves Jamestown. They grow their crops, they grow food to eat, but it would be tobacco that would change the tide in America. It would make um, the New World a valuable commodity. And John Rolfe is the guy that brings it. He's the one that marries Pocahontas um, when she's 19, and uh, he really makes America a viable place through the concept of tobacco. And it becomes the main cash crop of Virginia. And almost overnight it just booms and explodes into this amazing place that everybody wants to be a part of and uh, the land was offered for free to people that wanted to come over and settle and colonize um, and thousands of people came and uh, we talked about the type of people that showed up you have indentured servants people who are tied to the land for five to seven years who were poor and didn't have a way of getting over on their own they owe somebody their debt and they pay it off in that time period as an indentured servant okay that is a slave with a time frame and uh, then they get their freedom and they get a chance to own land so that was pretty cool because in england there was no chance of that um, this also bred the idea of the Virginia House of Burgesses, our first representative colonial body in American history, 1619. And this was a pretty revolutionary concept, allowing any adult, male, white, landowning churchgoer to have the right to vote and participate in governing. Now, remember, this is a royal colony. And it's a royal colony who follows the Anglican Church. And so, basically, the king's in charge, but the people have a voice in how they're taxed and how they are governed, what kind of laws they follow. So again, pretty much the beginning stages of self-governing. The Virginia House of Burgesses, again, had the power to make laws and raise taxes. So these are just a few of the legacies that uh, Virginia had to offer. And it was the start of our strong tradition of representative government in the English colonies. And it will only get better as more groups come to, to this country. So let's talk about the other colonies. Again, real briefly, here's Virginia. Here's the layout of everything we talked about. And this is kind of what your notes should look like. should have a pretty decent layout of this. But it's the other colonies that are also important. And so I'm going to go through those pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but um, the idea is that Maryland um, would also be a place of refuge in 1634. 
Uh, it's right next to Virginia, so it is, you know, easy kind of a neighbor there. But it was a refuge for Catholics. Remember, Catholics were also being driven out of England. And uh, yet, what's funny is more Protestants showed up. And the reason for that was because of how it was designed. Maryland was a place, even though it was supposed to be a Disneyland for Catholics, it was designed around religious freedom. And um, you had all these different people that were in charge of it. Uh, Lord Baltimore would be the last of uh, one of the major leaders of, of this colony. And uh, he made sure that there was a Toleration Act that got passed. And it was the first Toleration Act of its kind, which meant that it was by law going to be required that everybody get along. Um, the Carolinas were set up by eight proprietors, and eventually they divided up the Carolinas into two different ones so that they could govern over them. And uh, it was a refuge for pirates, shockingly, North Carolina was, but a great place for timber to build boats. Um, it had a byproduct of tar, uh, or tobacco, which was tar, to help seal the wood. Um, and the naval stores were the main export. Anything dealing with ocean, you know, ocean passage and travel you could find in, in North Carolina. It was one of the most democratic of all the colonies because they kind of had the they had the leftovers of Virginia the the people who ran away religious dissenters um, whatever uh, people wanted an opportunity they went to to North Carolina now they didn't grow a lot of crops like they did like in tobacco up in up in Virginia um, but they did have the opportunity to, to have subsistence farming and they mainly made their life on the um, ocean um, and trade they did offer religious freedom again, which made the colony kind of kind of blossom. South Carolina is going to be way different than most of the other colonies because it's established predominantly by a bunch of arist uh, aristocratic uh, French Huguenots um, who come over, and again, it's it's a totally different vibe, a totally different feel, but it's all plantation based, large plantations, huge plantations, and so everybody's spread out. There's only one major city, uh, Charlestown, and uh, it is designed to ship all the goods that they're growing: rice, indigo, tobacco wine, you name it, um, they grew it. But with plantations and lots of space for farming, you need a huge labor force. And they found that the indentured servant route was not very efficient because you'd have to let people leave. Well, slaves are a lot cheaper and they last forever. So this kind of really pushed the slavery issue in the South, was with South Carolina. And then lastly, we have Georgia, 1732. And uh, the reason I'm going through these so fast is because I had all the students read this, and then we discussed it and talked about it, um, and then we wrote down the notes together. So this is why we're, we're breezing through um, these colonies. But Georgia in 1732 was a refuge for debtors. A guy by the name of James Oglethorpe was its proprietor. He set it up. He was very strict. The people didn't like him. Um, remember, these are kind of the scrags of England. Uh, they're the leftovers, and they are only there because there's land and opportunity. And it's a dangerous place to be because you never know when a Spanish or a Native Americans might attack out of Florida or the French might come from Louisiana and attack you as well. So everybody was all nervous about living in Georgia, but it was designed as a military buffer against against the other European nations in America. So anyway, the South, southern colonies would develop immensely uh, and they would um, really, really prove to be very valuable as far as economics go towards the growth of our country. So hopefully you enjoyed that process. Um, again, all the dates are a little kind of iffy. They all vary and bounce around a little bit. Um, but the idea is that these southern colonies were uh, extremely valuable and important to the grand scheme of what our country would become. Thank you very much. We're on to the New England colonies.